Hi everyone, my name is Carlos Morales and this is the Truth Over Comfort podcast. On today's show, we have Aaron Whiting, a writer for Thoughts on Liberty and a personal friend of mine. How are you doing today, Aaron? Pretty good. How are you doing? Pretty great. Uh, so for people who've never listened to this show, Truth Over Comfort podcast is not just about liberty, but also about mental liberation. Liberation from the multitude of ill-conceived and manipulative notions which have been used for ages to control others. We actively strive for truth through reason and evidence rather than passively propagating politically correct propaganda to prevent anyone from feeling uncomfortable. How's that for alliteration? Anyway, our guest today has no problem with working to promote rationality over delusion, or any fear of stepping on anyone's toes, which she may have done very recently uh, when she came out to defend women who choose not to take the label of feminist. Aaron, now you once labeled yourself a feminist, but have since changed your mind on that particular subject. Care to tell our audience a bit more? Sure. Well, I always thought that a feminist was somebody who just basically believed in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. I mean, that's the Webster definition, so that seemed pretty good to me. Um, I realized, though, in talking to people that not only didn't adopt that label, but had a negative connotation from the label, that that wasn't a commonly accepted way to, uh, to interpret it. So I would get into discussions with people, and as soon as I would say, I'm a feminist, Anything else I said before or after would go out the window because I'd be dealing with their filters of what that word meant. And I realized that even though it took a little more time on the front end to just explain where I was coming from on an issue, then it saved me a lot of time on the back end of not having to explain what I meant when I said I was a feminist. So my perspective on issues haven't changed, but I just don't think that the label is as helpful as I once thought it was. Yeah, so pretty much you hit on the, the main word uh, that we're going to be hitting on today, which is the issue of labeling other individuals by certain categories, whether those labels be self-imposed or externally forced. In order to understand this idea, we need to delve into the idea of labels by dissecting what labels actually are, which are just a form of concept. And concepts are simply a shorthand way of explaining the entities which make it up. Concepts are nothing without these entities, but in order for us to be able to communicate, we must use concepts on occasion, as it's going to be completely overwhelming. If in every conversation I have to say every single cell that makes up Aaron in order to talk about Aaron. Aaron as a self, as a being, is a concept made up of cells which cul uh, culminated into making the person that she is. A concept is meaningless without the entities that make it up. In other words, a forest does not exist where there are no trees. What occurs occasionally, though, is that these concepts are used improperly as a form of manipulation whether that be consciously or unconsciously. In other words, concepts sometimes take a life of their own that have very little to do with the entities that they are trying to describe. A common example in the political realm is society. Societies are just groups of individuals who work with one another for their own benefit. That last bit is important there, which is for their own benefit, for their own self-interest. So when someone states you have to make sacrifices for the good of society, they are making the concept more important than the people that make up what the concept is in regards to. If you must sacrifice yourself for a concept which you are involved in due to your own self-interest, then that concept is in contradiction to the original idea. The manipulation of concepts to the point where they are arbitrarily redefined in order to gain control, whether physical or mental control, is constantly used, not just by politicians, but by parents, teachers, religious elders, and pretty much any authority figure which is trying to use unjust authority, unfounded authority, to rule another. A particular form of a concept, which is the topic of this show, is the labels that we put onto ourselves and others. 
Now, when we discuss logic, and something that I bring up time and time again, is that it's important to define the terms we are using in order for knowledge to be shared. If I say the word pig, anything I'm talking about a cow, then obviously we're going to have issues understanding one another. In the political realm, of course, things get even more interesting and convoluted. Take the word liberal. Liberal one point simply meant open-minded and fit into the free market realm of philosophical discourse. Now though, liberal more often than not means individuals who want to use force through the government to impose various beliefs. Very few of them pro-market, very few of them pro-competition or open-minded, especially in regards to ethics. Progressive is similar in that it usually means regressive or simply keeping the status quo. Supposedly progressive ideas are in many cases fascistically carried out programs which eliminate market competition or amount simply to blowing up other countries so they can progress to the wonderful constitutional republic system that you see today in America. Unless, of course, those countries then elect someone the U.S. government doesn't like. Well, then in that case, obviously you have to kill many of them so that they can restart. And within these progressive and liberal circles, new concepts, which are ill-defined, are then pressed upon others to make them feel guilty for things they are not in control of or didn't even exist. Words like white privilege, male privilege, thin privilege, and a whole list of other privileges which in many cases are not actually real or at least are not universal within these races and sexes. But people really love using the terms. The reason this happens is because it allows anything that occurs to be diagnosed instantly rather than taking a case-by-case -case basis. If you can diagnose people or label people, then you can dismiss anything they say before even listening, which is exactly what you were talking about, Aaron, when it came to feminism. Yeah, I, um, I experience this a lot now being in part of the liberty community. Um, I think it's, it's no secret that there's very few women compared to men in the liberty community. It's the, the ratios are always, you know, 60%, 70% male. So when you're trying to have a conversation with people who don't encounter women, especially women who identify as feminists on a regular basis, there are a lot of hurdles to overcome. And I realize that people that I agree with on a lot of things have already written me off when I when I use that term. And it's not even just the term feminist, you know. I mean, I think anyone within the movement knows that there's so much infighting about terms um, that it's just, you can derail an entire conversation by trying to explain who you are and what you mean. So I found that I don't think there's a label that I can adopt with the exception of maybe philosopher <laughs> that doesn't automatically have, you know, a negative connotation to somebody that, that isn't meant. So, yeah, and I, I know that um, one of the things you talked about was privilege, and I think that that conversation can shut down a lot of, uh, or the word privilege can shut down a lot of conversations. Uh, because you, it's another way of looking at somebody and assuming that their life is a certain way, that their perspectives are a certain way, that their experience is a certain way, and it's a really acceptable way to kind of be prejudiced nowadays, which um, I don't, I don't think that furthers logical discourse at all. Yeah, and privilege is one of those terms where it's pretty much unfalsifiable. So if I say something like male privilege, even in cases where I can disprove the statement, mm -hmm. they can just go on a broader scope and say like, oh, well, the reason why you have this is because of male privilege or white privilege or thin privilege. I had people telling me, I was in a, a discussion regarding uh, weight gain and, and how to lose weight and everything else, and mm -hmm. someone actually told me, well, you just say that because you have thin privilege. I used to be 330 pounds. So this, these are the contexts that are lost whenever someone makes up these, these statements because what it allows for is a completely uh, a shift of any kind of rationality so that you can only focus on the term because terms are easier to argue against. It's kind of like a straw man fallacy. Basically, you build up what the person supposedly is so that you can knock it down even when that's not what even the person stated. And libertarians are just as guilty of this as any other political uh, groups. I mean, I know that... 
I'm guilty of it. I mean, I've had conversations with other libertarians, and I'll say, oh, he's just a statist. Well, I mean, yes, maybe that person is for some kind of state existing, but that doesn't mean he thinks of it in the same way as someone else. Maybe it's for efficiency reasons rather than emotional reasons. Maybe it's because something happened to him in the past where he had to deal with the state and it was actually beneficial. So by us labeling people before we're even having a conversation, we're already cutting the conversation uh, down and removing any chance of actual dialogue from moving forward. If I'm talking to a Christian and I just go, well, you're just a fucking Christian, it's the same as if he just goes, well, you're just a fucking atheist. What they're doing is they're, whenever you group people together, it's easier to, to, to disregard any kind of work. So it's mm -hmm. lazy. Labeling in many, many cases is just lazy. It's the same reason we, we make incredibly abstract concepts uh, instead of just kind of shorter ones that allow us to basically have normal conversations um, where everything gets incredibly convoluted. Yeah, I mean, I was um, I was thinking about this earlier because, like you said, labels um, or calling things by a name as a shorthand is is important. It's a way to identify concepts and save time. The problem with most of the labels that we throw around nowadays is they don't have any real um, test or requirements or objective standards to adopt them. So if I were to call myself a doctor, you know, there's there's an there's an objective standard for what a doctor is. There's tests, there's schooling, there's requirements, and you could even, you know, get arrested for calling yourself a doctor, you know, impersonating a doctor without a license. With terms um, like liberal or conservative or feminist or libertarian or anarchist, these are terms that anyone can adopt them or give them to somebody else, and there's no, it, it's so subjective, the diagnosis of it. So when I say that I identify as, a, you know, a feminist, I have more in common with a lot of women I know who do not use the term feminist. In fact, some, some women I know in the liberty movement. Um, I have more in common with them than a lot of women I know who, uh, who identify as feminists but are, you know, ultra in favor of state intervention or very much in favor of public schooling or, or other things that I just not only don't like on, a, on an issue level, but I don't think they help women. I so, think you would probably have an issue with someone uh, stating something like feminism is socialism with panties, correct? Yes, yes, yes. That uh, that was definitely a hot bus button issue for me. And that the, the thing that really got to me about that, and I think got to a lot of women about that, was um, that statement lacked a lot of empathy because uh, the, the person who said that um, is involved in a movement that... Uh, that gets that that falls victim to the labeling fallacies all the time. So if you call yourself an uh, an anarchist, for example, there are a lot of people who are going to assume that that means you're an anti propertarian you're a socialist, and there are other people that are going to assume that means that you are violent and that you promote uh, aggression against the individual or against authority. But you know, Stefan is not somebody that thinks that at all. So when he was quoting feminists, that, uh, that he uses as an example for the statement feminists or socialists in panties, um, he was citing mainstream example of feminism that he didn't, you know, do any sort of research or go into any depth about what other perspectives of feminism really are. Because there's as much infighting among feminists as there is any major movement, really. I mean, it's not a cut and dry thing or a cut and dry concept. I find it interesting, though, that the dictionary labels it as feminism is about having equality for for both women and men, uh, in that it sounds almost by its very definition a belief in women, mm -hmm. as in you would think uh, humanism as mm -hmm. being a, uh, a term which would mean the uplifting of both. But, of course, even some, a word like secular humanism as its own label, as its own concept, is very very left leaning if you for most people who consider themselves uh, secular humanists, and it's just when we get caught up in these terms, it it's so perfect actually. Whenever we whenever we put ourselves in spe specific terms, especially like Republican or Democrat, mm -hmm. it allows us to stop thinking because I'm a liberal, therefore I believe in universal health care, public schooling, and welfare. Even though universal health care leads to many more deaths that public schooling is the, you know, antithetical to education and welfare has kept the poor poor. But since I'm a liberal, I'm supposed to believe in those things. The same with, you know, Republican, you're supposed to believe these these particular things, whatever they're supposed to believe in. And that's perfect for political pundits because instead of ever having to talk to you as a human being 
as someone who has their own values, needs, and everything else, they're able to just go, oh, well, I have these same values that you do, even though, of course, I always act against them. Uh, I mean, I believe before the show we were talking about Obama, and whenever Obama came out, he took off his mask, and it was George Bush the yeah. third. Um, and so it's it's a, it's it's a puppet show. It's all fake, and they're using these labels to uh, to better manipulate us. But overall, uh, kind of gets to more of the point here. Um, I, I think we really really lose ourselves uh, when we get caught up in these terms. And there's these uh, plural pronouns where it's terms like we or I. I mean, or excuse me, we or us. And this is where the collectivizing and labeling gets even better because what occurs is, is that I say, well, George Bush and the United States Army attacked Iraq, which led to 1.2 million deaths. They attacked Afghanistan, which led to, I don't know, 200,000 deaths and the destruction of any kind of economy they had, a poisoning of the, the ecosystem, basically deranging every single bit of progress that they've made over the last 100 years. And someone could come back up to me immediately and go, well, you're an American, so we did that. You see, that, 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 that first-person plural, uh, plural pronouns um, are used as another form of manipulation, which we get from you know instantly. As soon as we get into public school, it's all about we. As soon as we're part of a local sports team, we won. Um, and that kind of collectivizing, that kind of collectivism, is is integrally r related with labeling. I, I agree, and I think it comes from um, well, people are social animals. I mean, that's just the nature of our being, and people like to. Um, extract some sense of personal pride for accomplishments that they can in whatever way associate themselves with. I mean, people, you know, the, the cognitive dissidence that people just ignore that they must go through when, you know, they're celebrating the 4th of July, they're, you know, excited about it, but they um, promote levels of taxation and they promote government overreaches that, you know, rival anything that was faced in the 18th century. So, yes, I think those collective pronouns are something we're taught because we get to have that little positive feeling of, okay, so we get to take some pride out of what our local sports team did, out of what our government did, out of what our religious group did, out of what our um, nation of origin did. You know, people who are, you know, Irish pride, Italian pride, even if you never set foot in Europe. So um, we get that. That's, that's what our that's in our positive tally, that's what we get in exchange for, you know, that collectivization makes us want to defend the powers that be that are doing the things, that are, that are waging wars on other countries, that are um, committing genocide against people, that are bombing children, that are putting the children in this country in, in permanent debt. You know, it's, um, it's, it's what we exchange for the good feeling of the collectivism. We, we take that in exchange for the negative of it. And it's it's completely unconscious. I mean, people associate their labels with themselves. They start to identify by their labels. So if you dislike a label, if you attack a label, you're attacking them personally. And on the flip side, if you identify yourself with a label that is the antithesis of another person's label, or at least in their mind it is, they use that as a reason to attack you and discount anything that you might say. So I think Republicans and Democrats um, experience this a lot. I know I did when I was, when I identified as a liberal and a Democrat. And why did I do that? I did that because that's what I grew up with, you know, and so it was a family label and I was given a definition of it, you know, from my family that, uh, that, that made a lot of sense to me. You know, Democrats care about poor people, they care about freedom, they care about uh, right. you know, gender equality, and Republicans, you know, are the other. They don't. So to me, um, calling someone a Republican or lab someone labeling themselves a Republican, the short was shorthand for saying they were extremely religious, they liked war, they didn't like minorities, or at least they thought that they had a place. Um, and I just, you know, that, that label served me for years. And when I challenged it, when I realized that it was reductive to the point of just being completely inaccurate, and stepped outside of that, I was able to look at people. It's kind of like the, the Plato's Cave, you know, allegory. You're able to look back in and see people who still are under that perspective. So when regimes change, but nothing else does, you see them changing 
their their actual beliefs, their actual virtues, to reflect the the label that they're in. So we've all heard this, where um, liberals who were so anti-war for eight years under Bush are all of a sudden defending warmongering tactics now that there's a Democrat in the White House. And um, it's, it's become almost of an inside joke among people who, you know, recognize it, who stepped outside of it. And I do know people who identify as Democrats and progressives who completely condemn the current administration and its tactics, but because they call themselves progressives and liberals, as you've already said, you know, people who hear that label think, oh, they automatically support these oppressive, violent, forceful tactics. And it's, it's um, I think that it, it does you a lot more, it, it behooves you to put the label aside, at least temporarily, explain where you're coming from, and then after the fact, if you want to say, I identify as a progressive, a Democrat, a Republican, a feminist, then that is definitely a, a better approach than coming up with that label up front and then having to work through all the barriers that have been instantly put up by whoever you're speaking to. Yeah, and labeling is something I've had to kind of rethink as a whole um, because it's something that I've, I've done so easily for such a, a really long period of time. Um, I ran an atheist group uh, for about six years, and we did a lot of things to essentially categorize certain individuals in order to kind of meet up with whatever mindset we had, we collectivized ourselves. Well, we are the uh, kind of we are the atheists, and what I found was that many, just within the own atheists, the people that was uh, that I knew, there was amazing amount of disagreement on very principled things. I mean, ethically, we were all you know everywhere, but we felt that because we were atheists, we should collectivize our group and form a coalition against the religion rather than looking at the reasons for these irrationalities and also looking to atheists themselves who are having uh, issues. Um, Richard Dawkins, I think, is a perfect example of that. I watched Richard Dawkins give a speech and, you know, I'm an atheist, so I was just like, woo, you know, fucking A, fucking a. you know, Richard Dawkins is out there, he's going to give a great speech, it's going to be awesome. He gave a speech in front of Capitol Hill in Austin, Texas, this was right around the election of Romney and Obama, in which he proceeded to state uh, everything about Romney's religion, basically stating, well, he's a Mormon, these are all the crazy things he believes in, yada, yada, yada. And this was in 2012. Remember, Obama had already eliminated a lot of human beings off the face of this earth, had repeatedly stated that he was a Christian, had done a number of incredibly terrible things to prove, uh, to, to go against any idea that this is a good human being. And then he proceeded to state that we should vote for Obama because Obama is most likely an atheist which blew my mind. I mean, it had every single form of, uh, of idiocy and collectivism that you could possibly imagine. First off, we should be electing someone to lead us. Uh, secondly, we should be electing this guy because he may be lying. You see, because if he is an atheist, then he's a compulsive liar. And we should like the fact that he is a compulsive liar. And third, that we should, we should associate with him uh, even though he's a mass-murdering, genocidal fuck. Uh, and so... I mean, I, I saw a similar thing, you know, when it came to Sam Harris. I mean, that guy believes in a real New World Order, a real globalist government. Um, when I saw Christopher Hitchens, I really liked what he had to say, but he was just so pro-Iraq war and everything else. So you see all these different groups of atheists coming along who are supposedly individualistic in their thinking and rational-minded. Mm -hmm. But as a collective, they are just as irrational and non-thinking as, uh, as any group of individuals many times that, that you'll see. I... Do I think it's important for people to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, truth over falsehood and therefore remove the delusion of religion from their own life? Absolutely, but I think you have to be logically consistent whenever you're trying to approach any single kind of position. And if you are embracing the idea that we need to have a overlord who uses violence against us by using the threat of force, which then extracts money from us, which he then uses that money in order to force us to do things, um, that's its own kind of irrational hell. That's its own form of of insane religion, um, statism, and you know, a lot of that again. It just it's all co late, uh, coming from uh, collectivism. It's coming from conformity, and the conformity is a direct result of the label that they put onto themselves. Yeah, and I think one thing to keep in mind is very few people think they're irrational. You know, just like no nobody really thinks they're a bad person, very few people think they're irrational. So when they believe contradictory things, 
there's a lot of after the fact attempts at rationalization. So um, Richard Dawkins, you know, he he bought into the either or uh, scenario the that you have to go, you know, Obama or Romney. You have, you know, this this two party system. So he knew that Romney was off the table because of his extreme religion. But here is this guy who, you know, has, has claimed himself to be this rational skeptic, this atheist, and he's an atheist for um, logical reasons. Uh, you know, he he has to justify the fact that he's going to vote for Obama because he's bought into the, you know, uh, the either or fallacy, the um, or the uh, the false the false dichotomy. You have to pick one or the other. Yeah. So he he just rationalized it after the fact, and you see that so often with people when they want to either ascribe a label to somebody for positive or negative reasons. So an atheist, when it comes right down to it, is somebody who is without theism, without a belief in God, or, or at least in the absence of evidence of one. But for Obama to say that he does believe in a God and the fact that you know all evidence points to that, I mean, he attends church, you know, it, it's, it's, he, Dawkins had to find a way to work around and rationalize it, and we see that so often with people trying to rationalize, well, I am, you know, I am an anarchist or I am a libertarian, however, I believe in the use of force to rationalize my brand of morality or, um, you know, what, what I think is important, and there's always a, a workaround way to, to justify that. I mean, people either want freedom for others or people want freedom for themselves. And when you want freedom for yourself, that, that really isn't actually freedom. You just kind of want to enforce your idea of morality. So I think that's another kind of labeling issue that, that people get into. They say, well, I am part of the liberty movement. I'm a libertarian. But they don't even fit the litmus test for a lot of other people. And it's really difficult to, um, to adopt any label when you don't know who's represented you to others. You know? So you, you are an atheist, you've been you know, an outspoken one, you've been in movements, but you wouldn't want to be represented by somebody who promoted the election of Obama on those grounds, right? Absolutely, and when you think about you know, categorizing yourself, I remember uh, right after the Pierce Morgan and Alex Jones interview where Alex Jones just went bug nutty on CNN and just started screaming about 9-11 and everything else, he woke up the next morning, got on the show, and goes, I am the head of the liberty movement. And basically stated categorically that he was the liberty movement. And yeah. that because we consider ourselves libertarians, therefore we must be led by him. Uh, which is just insane, but that's that's what can occur whenever you're putting yourself under these labels. And, and you know, I, I try to take back terms, I guess. You know, when Glenn Beck said he was a libertarian, and I was just completely perplexed. I was... Mm -hmm. uh, my mind is blown uh, as far as that con is concerned. So what I think, why I wouldn't exactly call this show a liberty show is because that's not the most integral part of what we're doing here. I think what I'm trying to do with, the, with this podcast is to liberate ourselves from any kind of the confines that are being placed on us by any kind of factors, whether that be manipulative libertarians like, say, Glenn Beck, or manipulative atheists like uh, all of the communists, or... Uh, or Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, or uh, uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, just trying to liberate ourselves from those so that we become individuals. Uh, and that's also, you know, why we're, we're, we're trying to, to move forward in a way that isn't uh, everybody follow me. Instead, these are the tools to gather knowledge as best we know we can at this time. Yeah. From there, let us try and extract what is true and what is false. And I think that's impo more important than just going, I'm not a fucking statist. Right. Because again, you're, uh, you're, you're actually following the path there and you're explaining where you come from as opposed to just relying on the label and whatever it means to do it for you. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you and I first met, as a matter of fact, you know, yeah. <laughs> One of the first things that uh, you found out about me was that uh, I uh, I don't eat meat. I am a vegan. So yeah. and and there was you know an association that you made with that, and it wasn't positive. But I will I will tell you what I wasn't that put off because I've 
I, it wasn't my first rodeo, and I've had a lot of people make assumptions about me based on that. I mean, I, I learned a long time ago that I didn't want to be associated with, um, with forceful people or with irrational people or with people that lacked empathy. And that meant I didn't want to be lumped into, you know, oh, you like PETA or you support the, um, the outlawing of me. You know, these are things that I didn't want. So you're telling me you're a PETA-loving feminist, vegan, socialist, communist, right? Is that what you know what? Yeah. Quote me. No, <laughs> no, it's uh, it. But but you made those associations. You're not the first one. And I realized that just telling people, I actually don't eat meat, saved me a long time because people didn't know why. People, you know, it, and it and it not only helped me from a, what people think about me in terms of um, negative connotations. I can't tell you how many people have thought because I'm a vegetarian they could take me out for some surf and turf. Or you know can can make me some lobster or something because vegetarians eat fish, right? You know, but <laughs> yeah, well, California vegetarians do. I've I've known some people from California who call themselves vegans, but like I'm a vegan except I eat cow on occasion. Yeah, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, and there there is more of a concrete definition for that term, I would say, than any of the other terms we've explored. I mean, you you brought it up earlier um, that the word feminist is uh, problematic for you because just the the linguistics of it are leaning towards women. And I've heard that before um, from a lot of people. The uh, the origin of the word is actually interesting. It's um, It comes from, well, somewhat interesting. It's, uh, in, it's an 18th century uh, word. It comes from France in uh, the 1800s. And originally it just meant to promote women's rights. And that made sense at the time because women didn't have many. So the word feminist was the word was picked because it was trying to level the playing field. It was actually coined by someone who wasn't even talking about equality of the sexes. Um, it, uh, Charles Fourier, I think that's how you pronounce it. He wasn't talking about promoting gender equality. He just was talking about getting women some rights that they were seriously lacking. And then later the term went on to mean you know social, political, and economic equality. But the, the meaning of the word has evolved with the people that use it. So I still don't look at women who call themselves feminists and automatically assume she must promote uh, you know, the use of government intervention to achieve her ends. She must dislike men. She must promote affirmative action. Like I don't make those assumptions because that... Well, is I, I think the assumptions that are being made not necessarily half-cocked. I mean, whenever you institutionalize a particular term, especially within academia, you're going to have a group of individuals who are going to be backing government uh, for particular things because in many cases, and I mean I took feminist lit and I've dealt with many different feminists who basically think that because you're a man you're almost born evil, like you are more inclined to rape and do all these terrible things and there's also this notion that men run the world. Uh, and that that women are just subjugated uh, to all this stuff. When you and when you come to really realize that uh, men in many of these cases are, you know, being screwed over in places like uh, family court and domestic violence cases. Um, and when you look even broader, if men were ruling the world, why is it only men have to sign up for things like the draft? Um, why are men the ones who are suffering 85% of workplace-related uh, deaths? Um, so. If you, when you really start to dissect it compared to the institutionalized version of feminism, which you find in academia, is that the truth is a lot more complicated than the way they're presenting it. I mean, especially whenever they come up with, you know, gender wage gap. Well, have you taken a look at how statistics were come up with? Is it always consistent, and is it because of sexism that there may be a differentiation between the wages? Uh, have you actually looked at the statistics in regards to rape? Uh, have you looked at the statistics in regards to um, you know, the, the, a variety of different criminal cases where you see repeatedly women getting off as far as violent crime goes, nearly scot-free in a lot of these cases in comparison to men. So it's not that it's not that the society is set up for women or society is set up for men. It's that society is set up in a way which causes a massive amount of manipulation of individuals through the use of violence, which leads to this case. So it's not about going men are bad or women are bad. It's the the colossal clusterfuck that is known as the United States government or governments worldwide are what's really causing a lot of these issues and not just patriarchy or matriarchy. 
Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, any person who says directly or indirectly that um, a classification of people by their very nature is responsible for the ills of the world, uh, you automatically have to question their, uh, their reasoning abilities. You know, if you're saying a person based on, you know, race, gender, orientation, um, essential qualities of themselves is therefore responsible for society's ills, they're not, they're, they've already made logical fallacies. They've already, you know, missed a lot of steps along the way. So um, that's first of all. Now, there were a lot of issues you talked about, and I have, you know, various opinions about them, and I'm going to be honest right now, I'm not the most informed feminist scholar there is out there. There are people that... Really? I couldn't find that one? Damn it. <laughs> I thought it was all you. I thought you were the only intelligent feminist out there. I'm, I'm the diplomat for my people, but that doesn't... No, <laughs> no not at all. But I, I do... I've done a lot of reading about a lot of different subjects, and the jury's still out for me on a few things. That's why I like to take things from an individual basis, because... I don't want to say, okay, I'm a feminist and therefore I feel the same way that all feminists do about rape culture and the gender wage gap and domestic violence. It doesn't mean I don't agree with them on a lot of points. It doesn't mean that I don't think that there's more research to do. I don't think it necessarily has to be a um, we're right or you're right kind of scenario. I think they're complicated issues. There's a lot of research to be done and there's a lot of mitigating factors to be explored before anyone makes a conclusion. And I think that yeah, there's been a lot of unfair um, lumping of blame for on, on both sides. You know, when you talk about male privilege, I think this is something we talked about a while ago. And while I do think male privilege exists, I don't think it's as um, cut and dry as if you're a male, you're experiencing male privilege. I also think, and you probably acknowledge this, that there is a female privilege that exists. For example, I'm never going to get drafted. You know, that's that's a privilege. Did I choose that privilege? No. Do I necessarily benefit from it if someone I loved gets drafted? No, absolutely not. And I think that it's it's too cut and dry to say, oh, you're experiencing male privilege because you're a man. When, you know, being a man may have meant that you are automatically written off as someone who's violent or someone who's aggressive or you may have been overlooked for a position based on that. So, yeah, when you, when you look at the actual statistics in regards to when uh, people say that men are more violent and women are more caring, you know, you, you find statistics basically state things like, you know, 80% of child abuse is actually carried out by mothers and not fathers. And if you say the argument that it's because women are around them more often, abuse is not an eventuality. It's something that occurs. It's not like if I spend a whole bunch of time with a coworker, then necessarily that's going to lead to me punching him in the face. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at uh, things in regards to, again, the gender wage gap, um, and you look at some of the statistics how they come up with, they would say, oh, well, doctor, male doctors make this amount of money, female doctors make this amount of money, but they weren't looking at the specialty because men are more likely to be things like pulmonologists, neurologists, and, and a number of different specialized positions in comparison to women who are going to pediatrics or going into just general practice, which necessarily which make less money because there's more of them. And when you were looking at, if you look at domestic violence cases, um, a lot of these cases, even if the man were to go to the cops and say a woman was hitting me, they would still arrest the man in many of these cases, which is absolutely horrifying. But it's coming from the same notion and idea that, that men are these more violent creatures uh, without ever thinking about who is who in many cases is raising these men and what are the... What are the the pressure, social pressures being put on these men in order to extract these these specific things? Uh, so I think it all gets incredibly cloudy whenever you look at the the facts in regards to that. And another one is rape culture. Well, if when you say rape culture, you mean, um, you know, if you watch Law and Order, they make jokes to criminals that if they don't admit to smoking some pot, that they are going to have Bubba as a boyfriend. That would be rape culture, seeing as how men are more likely to be raped than women. Yes, it's because that kind of rape occurs in prisons, but it's still something that needs to be thought about. And I find incredibly disgusting is when people make jokes about men being raped in prison. It's like, oh, he's going to be your girlfriend. You're going to be his girlfriend, or something like that. If you think of it in context, those are really those those are real things that are occurring. And when eighty percent of jail population is for nonviolent offenders, it actually might be more than that. And people are getting raped in cages for plants that they have in their pocket. 
the whole thing just gets thrown out the window when it comes to this idea that that it's it's rape culture is only regards to women that the violence it has to do with with um, men committing violence against women that uh, child abuse is mostly male centered against children but when you watch any kind of TV shows for the most part it's always the man is carrying out the child abuse so there's this there's this common myth against men in many of these cases and people like Stefan Molyneux have brought it up people like Warren Farrell have brought it up and some MRA guys have brought it up and of course men's rights advocates though they get in the same issue of labeling when many of them uh, assert that all women are bitches or all women are doing this one thing or all feminists are doing this thing and I can get caught up in that motion too but I think it, it's it's easy to do and it's easy to come from that kind of passionate thing because whenever you actually meet the people who have these positions well then it gets all a little bit more difficult to judge everyone in this one little scope this one little concept of idea when you actually meet a real status for instance yeah and um, well what I think and you touched on it because um, I've heard this a lot about rape culture, for example. So rape culture is another kind of labeling thing, and I've seen so much fighting about it. But if we're really talking about rape culture, most of the feminists I know, and again, this is anecdotal, um, would lump in prison rape to that. They would also discuss the fact that if uh, a male experiences sexual assault at the hands of a woman, um, especially if there is you know, the, uh, the age difference, the statutory rape situation, it's just considered a uh, oh he got lucky whereas you know if the genders are reversed then a, a girl is victimized um, this is something that's talked about and I think that's an example of where there is a there's a sexist double standard that um, that negatively impacts men and what I hate when discussing about rape culture is that it becomes a, a gender war rape is a real problem and it's a real problem regardless of who is the uh, victim and who is the perpetrator and I think when we spend a lot of time saying, well, men are more likely to rape than women, or when we spend a lot of time saying, well, women are more likely to rape than men, we don't actually discuss the real problem, which is the fact that our society has fetishized and um, excused sexual assault as a means of dominance, as uh, a means of control, and, it, and whoever it's coming from, it's wrong. So I think that it's, it's one of the big things that I think is a, a tragedy, that we spend more time fighting about who is responsible for it and who, um, who by their very nature, is a uh, participant in rape culture rather than actually discussing ways we can deal with it. Um, this is also an issue where I differ from feminists on, uh, on a certain topping point, talking point. So... Um, a couple months ago, an article came out uh, in Slate, written by Emily Yoff, about how drinking on college campuses can contribute to sexual assault. And her basic thesis was that rapists use the fact that you're uh, inebriated as, as a means to prey on you. They use it as a tool to take advantage of you sexually. So a way to prevent that from happening is to watch what you drink. And she said a couple of times in the article, let me be clear, if you're raped, it's the fault of the person who did it. But she was immediately attacked as a rape apologist and told that she was justifying rape culture. And my stance on it was, look, even if what she said could have been phrased better, I don't think it's a good idea to attack somebody who's saying, hey, here's a problem, let's discuss a way to fix it. Um, she was lumped in with people that say, if you dress a certain way, that you're responsible for your sexual assault, which... I think it's completely different because then you're saying that, uh, well, for example, you talk about somebody saying, look, if you, if you drink in excess, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable situation. You're not excusing the behavior of the other person. You're just saying this is a way that they can overpower you. This is a way that they can get a physical advantage on you to do the wrong thing that they're going to do. Whereas if you equate the way someone dresses with their victimization, you're saying, oh, what you, the way you dressed turned an otherwise normal person into a violent perpetrator. So I think that that was something where most, uh, most women that I knew that identified as feminists became very angry with that position that, look, if you're going to drink, um, here's just some of the risks you might face. And when I told people that you know I disagreed with that, I got a lot of um, double takes because they thought, well, I thought you were a feminist or I thought you believed in women's equality and women's rights and I do. 
I just think that there's. Do you think there's a tendency within the feminist community to take away self responsibility from women? You know, I won't say yes, and that's because the feminist community is so nuanced and so um, so divided that I do think within certain groups of it, sure. But I'd say saying like uh, that would be like me asking you uh, again, just to use an example that might be a little more relevant. Do you think there is a tendency in the anarchist community to equate property with theft? Well, the, then is the term feminist so subjective that it's become worthless? Um, I don't know about subjective, but I think specialized. Because uh, you see, the thing about anarchists is, like, if I say I'm a free market anarchist, well, there's some very specific things within there. It means I'm against the state completely, that I acknowledge self-ownership, and that private property exists, and it's axiomatically uh, derives from self-ownership. Mm -hmm. So those are very, very sad things. Feminism is such a wide range word um, that I feel as if it can just be, it's, it's so convoluted that it might just be you know, antiquated and, and un unnecessary. I, I go back and forth with it, but... Um, so you said you say if you're a free market anarchist, that that comes with it, you know, certain, um, you know, believes you believe in the sovereignty of the individual, you believe in the the. Um, yeah, self ownership, private property. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I say I'm a sex positive feminist, you know, or an anarcha feminist, you know, with that comes certain meaning too. There's um, an anarcha feminist. There absolutely is. Uh, Wendy yeah. McElroy, yeah, she, uh, she's actually, yeah. Um, they, and they believe that the oppression of women comes from the state. So they do not, you know, they're not the ones that would be promoting universal health care or, um, you know, affirmative action, things like that. So there's a lot of infighting among sex positive, sex, ne sex negative feminists. There's radical cultural feminists, liberal cultural feminists, because there's so many nuanced variations I think when you just say the word feminist, people that don't that aren't studied in all those variations, and I'm not even studied in all those variations, um, are going to associate it with whoever they happen to know that uses that term. And if that person happens to be uh, sex negative, if that person happens to be like you talked about, a kind of person who infantilizes women, which yes, to kind of go back to your question, I do think that there is a tendency among people who make that case that um, there is an infantilization going along. With it now. That being said, the 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 tendency to do that I don't think is necessarily synonymous with feminism, because there's just so much infighting among the group that I think to say that would really discount the work of women who identify with the label, but uh, don't don't believe that. I mean, my problem with the label isn't so much that it in of itself is wrong. My problem with the label is that somebody who could be completely on board with everything you think and feel about, um, you know, free market principles, about um, the, uh, the non-aggression principle, about, um, you know, just rational self-interest, all those things. If they call themselves a feminist, you might miss all that because that label doesn't mean what you think it means to them. So I, I don't have a problem with the label in and of itself. And I would urge people that if you meet someone that calls themselves a feminist, rather than automatically discounting them for that, or automatically thinking that they're, you know, a like-minded individual, do a little probing. Ask what they mean. Ask how they, uh, how they came to that term, how they came to that identity. And I would encourage that with any identity, really, because just the label itself only means what that person thinks it means. It's only as valuable as what their interpretation is. Yeah, so essentially uh, the words that we're using are not necessarily based off of the definition from the Webster's. It's more, it's more reality of words are ever-changing, and therefore we have to acknowledge that fact and get people to define things whenever we're talking, which is pretty much the, the first rule of logic uh, or the idea of, 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 of identity is A equals A, so you're trying to understand what they're stating. And so I think that'll, that can pretty much do it as far as in order for us to be able to converse with other human beings and actually move forward in the form of dialogue to try and figure out what is true and what is false, we always have to be able to define the terms that we're using and 
accept the fact that a label can be incredibly misleading whenever someone states the term. Yes, there can be specific times where it is it can be necessary, and lumping in some cases is necessary just as a shorthand way of being able to uh, gather information and to better other understand individuals. Um, but we have to try and accept the fact that individuals have different ideas in regards to specific topics, and just because you call yourself one thing, it doesn't mean they are just like everyone else who thinks that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Aaron, uh, you can be found on the Thoughts on Liberty page, correct? Yes. Okay, as great. well as Facebook and Twitter. Okay, and you can find us on uh, truthovercomfort.net. Uh, uh, and as always, we are brought to you by the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and have a good day.